So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you to this uh, very important uh, event that we uh, have annually from the uh, Cocalise program. My name is Brian Mandel. I teach at the uh, Kennedy School of Government, and I am the proud faculty chair of this program. I want to uh, take a moment to uh, introduce our speaker for this uh, evening. Stanley Hoffman is the Paul and Catherine Blutengrieser University professor at Harvard, and he has taught here since 1955. I can think of no other uh, colleague at uh, Harvard University who has thought so long and hard about the deepest and most penetrating uh, issues of uh, international relations. Uh, his books are well known to all of us, from decline or renewal to primacy or world order to uh, ethics and the politics of humanitarian intervention and work on world disorders. And maybe that is in, uh, quite appropriate for uh, current events uh, for today. As we begin to think about the theme of uh, our conference on uh, continuity and change, uh, both Europe, the U.S., and, and globally. We only have to think of uh, current events from Tunisia to Egypt to uh, Yemen. We think about, in particular, the role of social media, for example, in accelerating some of the challenging changes now going on from Tunisia to uh, Egypt. And it seems to me that uh, institutions, regimes, are more fragile than ever, and it takes very little uh, to begin to think about how change, how turbulence and uncertainty can turn in part our world uh, upside down. But uh, Professor Hoffman, as I understand our jobs, we are not necessarily uh, forecasters, but we are, are those who try to uh, stand back and get some perspective on the uh, deep structures of international uh, relations. And Without further ado, I want to uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Hoffman to the podium uh, to share his views with us uh, on these important subjects. Uh, he will speak for a short while, and we want to make sure that we have an opportunity for some uh, Q&A. I would only ask that during the Q&A you briefly uh, uh, identify yourself. Professor Hoffman. I have to confess that I haven't written anything in about a year, uh, being, uh, uh, I would say, depressed by the state of the world, even more so by the state of this great country. Um, uh, that's another subject. Um, not particularly uh, enthused by the current state of Harvard, and certainly not by that of my department. So I've been extremely quiet and depressed, and I think that the recent events, uh, particularly those of this week, have given me an ardent desire to get back to writing. Because how often does one see revolutionaries who spend their life uh, on, um, to me, totally mysterious things, I don't even use a computer, like the internet and all these mechanical things, uh, and uh, the defenders of social order appearing on camels uh, and other mm, uh, dangerous but unlikely animals. Uh, uh, this is a totally crazy world. It's even crazier than a recent American election campaign, and that takes something. Um, uh, next to that, the, the Tea Party seem orderly, uh, reasonable, and, and, and learned. Uh, anyhow, so maybe I'll write something sooner or later. But uh, I am not a specialist of Southeast Asia or of Southeast Europe. I recently almost became one because my wife and I were asked to go on a Harvard alumni cruise. It turned out after 50 pages of, uh, of paper uh, about what the cruise was about, that it wasn't at all about, about Harvard alumni. It was about alumni from Harvard, from Yale, from various places in California. Uh, 
I shouldn't say so. But the Yaleys were the most impressive, the former <laughs> Yale students. There were more of them, but they were very interesting. Uh, they were mainly uh, not particularly young. They were not particularly poor. Uh, they were not particularly members of the Democratic Party. <laughs> uh, there were three lecturers, one from Yale, one from California, and, and me. And uh, these uh, ex-alumni of different places had one thing in common. They did not want to hear a word about Sarah Palin. <laughs> uh, they considered that she was a disgrace to their party. It was, in other words, uh, high class. <laughs> but that's, uh, I had not been in, in Central Europe uh, in years and years. And it was interesting and a bit depressing um, from the point of view of tourism, if you like. I had not expected, for instance, uh, that Prague, where I had last been in 1990, uh, and uh, 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 Vienna, where I had been five years ago, uh, would be transformed into essentially big markets with people buying, buying, buying. In other words, it could have been anywhere in the West. Now, that may have been progress, but it wasn't very picturesque. One had to wait till Budapest to find a place that was very picturesque, that was not just a mar an international market, because they had one great advantage, which I think allows them to preserve their original culture. It is that very few people can understand Hungarian. Uh, there are lots of people who speak uh, German. There are lots of people who, in those countries, speak English. Uh, so Budapest was uh, very, very beautiful, especially at night. But that's about my experience of, uh, of Central and, and South uh, East Europe. I know that I was born in Vienna, but that's all I ever did there. I had a mother who was Austrian and hated Austria and Austrians. So when I was tiny, she moved herself and little me uh, to a place which has nothing to do with uh, the Danube, and which is known as Nice. And Nice had many advantages, like permanently good weather and the Mediterranean. But that's all I know. However, I will pretend that I know something, and will make uh, three series of remarks. Being French, I cannot help but divide everything into three. <laughs> I've been doing it all my life, and uh, I've I'm now teaching with a very good friend uh, from at the Kennedy School who divides everything into four. Uh, so we have to reach a modus vivendi. Yeah, that's uh, Reverend Brian here. I want to say a few things, uh, because I don't think that's the most interesting aspect. It is interesting, but it's not. Uh, I don't know enough about it. Uh, which is what's happening internally in that uh, big, big part of Europe. I want to say a few things about uh, how this area participates in uh, the construction of, of Europe, the, the continuation of the construction of Europe. And I want to end up with some remarks, uh, mainly ill-humored, uh, about Europe in the world. On the internal aspect, um, I think that many of the developments uh, which are taking place in an area which God knows has been uh, ridden with conflicts, uh, uh, crimes, murders, what have you, <coughs> that on the whole there are many signs which are relatively encouraging. Uh, don't, uh, don't expect me to be an optimist about international affairs ever. But still, it could be much worse. Um, for instance, there are signs of reconciliation there uh, among countries or between countries that have been fighting each other uh, for many centuries or for much of their existence. Uh, who would have thought that the relations between uh, Germany and Poland, uh, which uh, were not always very good, as you know, would be, uh, it's always not ideal, but they are peaceful, well, there are exchanges, there are visits, there are no ma major uh, political problems there. Um, it's slower among the former members of, of Yugoslavia uh, because the, the, mass the massacres, the disasters of the 90s uh, 
are still very close, but even there, there is some uh, progress. It's going to be slow, uh, but um, if you look, for instance, at the relations between Serbia and Kosovo, even though it's not exactly harmony yet, uh, we're very far from uh, the uh, uh, somewhat ferocious uh, uh, immediate aftermath of uh, the wars of, of the late 90s. And uh, there is also generally in those countries, it seems to be, and not only because some of them have become big markets, an opening to the world. Uh, their members travel, people come there, the sort of very unique characteristic which that part of Europe has uh, had for so long, and uh, which one finds uh, beautifully described in a large number of sinister novels, uh, this, I think, is much less acute than it was before. So that these are signs of, of progress. On participation in the construction of Europe, there are, of course, uh, uh, difficulties. There are um, um, uh, everything that's uh, still mentioned from time to time uh, in American newspapers. Uh, there are the difficulties which are mentioned in practically every column uh, written by Paul Krugman. Uh, and of course, the reasoning in itself is not wrong. Uh, this is not a federal state. It seems that he has discovered that two weeks ago. Um, uh, he should have read my book, but anyhow. Um, I've been saying this for the last 50 years or more, that this is not a federal state they're building. Some of them would have liked to, but you know, uh, you can't improvise that, at least one could say. So he has discovered that since it isn't a federal state, since it doesn't have strong central institutions, uh, it is permanently in trouble uh, because it would take a strong central uh, government, uh, strong central financial institutions uh, to turn it into something uh, as uh, effective, uh, um, harmonious, and uh, happy as the United States. Well, maybe, but I think that uh, the contrast, blunt contrast between a very centralized uh, na nation state on the one hand uh, and uh, a sort of intergovernmental mess is ex much, ex uh, ex very excessive. And that if one follows uh, the, the development of the EU uh, and especially the relative, to the relative, ease in which it has expanded to a number of countries who had been in the other Europe for so long, it is not so bad. And if one compares the difficulties of the uh, present EU uh, with the difficulties of the United States, well, the United States has a central government, the United States has uh, a single uh, and of a very efficient army, uh, it has uh, a central bank, uh, and it has uh, 26 states uh, which carry before the Supreme Court their conviction that the, bi uh, the health uh, care bill uh, is unconstitutional. So uh, everybody sees only the flaws of the other, and uh, that is uh, too bad. But if I look at the development of the EU including uh, these new members, uh, that there's more progress to be, to be made, but it is still remarkable. Uh, the 90s are not so far behind us. It is a considerable progress. And if one expects that Europe will ever be uh, something like, uh, um, the, the, how should I put it, the idyllic image of France with a central government, uh, a bureaucracy which rules absolutely everything, and people who celebrate the 14th of July uh, enthusiastically every year, even though quite a number of them are uh, old royalists, etc., uh, etc. Et it is not as bad as all that. Um, and Krugman himself, uh, at least some tribute to him, in his article in the Times Magazine of uh, 
last week, was it? Uh, I, I keep losing my sense of time. Uh, the Sunday before, yeah. The, his article, I thought, was, uh, was uh, very sensible. I wouldn't say the same thing of Steve Erlinger's article. Uh, but anyhow, that's another matter. So there are difficulties. On the other hand, those difficulties of the EU pale a, rel a little bit if one compares them with the difficulties of the United States. Uh, there are different ways in which areas or countries can be divided. In the case of the US, uh, federalism doesn't work very well. The separation of powers paralyzes the executive, etc., etc. But all we can see uh, is that the European institutions are not as strong as ours are on paper. So there are difficulties, however. Right. Uh, still, uh, there are some unmistakable signs of progress. It seems to me that the new British government, uh, uh, which is after all a predominantly conservative government, uh, is much more involved in the uh, construction uh, of Europe than many of its predecessors or, or any, or, of all parties were and take a much more active uh, role in it, which I think is all to the good. Um, it seems to me that uh, the uh, cooperation which has manifested itself around uh, the financial crises of, uh, uh, of Portugal and of Greece uh, between uh, the IMF and the institutions of the EU is another form of progress. Uh, it's been interpreted here often as saying, you see, they can't, they can't deal with their own house. They need the IMF. Well, what's wrong with cooperation between an international agency like the IMF and uh, the financial institutions of the EU itself? So I don't think that uh, the role that Europe plays uh, within the international system at present uh, is as negligible is all this. And that brings me to my, my third and, and, and last point, which has to do uh, with Europe uh, in the world. Uh, the relations with the United States are really uh, fascinating to study. Uh, most of what one, uh, well, uh, let me begin with the beginning. Most American newspapers do not mention Europe. It's as if it had fallen off uh, a glacier or whatever, but it's not there. Uh, you can open uh, your daily, uh, um, uh, the French word for it is torchon. What's the best English word for it? Your daily uh, a piece of paper, which uh, will give you the latest uh, news about who was murdered in his sleep and who uh, froze to death and so on, without ever reading that Europe exists. There are basically, it seems to me, two newspapers which still talk uh, about Europe. Uh, they are the New York Times and uh, the Wall Street Journal. And both are, uh, to be generous, wrong more than half of the time. It is rather exasperating for a European. Every other day, the Times or the Wall Street Journal um, uh, will uh, produce an article saying that once again they can't agree on anything. The EU, the, the uh, European uh, the euro will soon disappear. Uh, Greece uh, will have a following uh, of equally inept countries that will tear this whole machinery down. Then uh, the next day, unfortunately, uh, there is an agreement reached among the members of the EU. Uh, it may not be a very glorified uh, agreement, but it is an agreement, which among 27 countries is not such a bad thing. And that is mentioned in about three lines, and you have to go looking for those lines with a magnifying glass. Then the next day, again, there's a big crisis out of which it will be very difficult for the Europeans to get out. And this has been the pattern now, week after week. I don't know how much longer it can go on, because after a while it's, it's terribly predictable. They should at least invent something new. But this has been it. And, uh, I think the explanation uh, one would need a psychoanalysis uh, of, uh, uh, of America for that, but I think there is an enormous amount of schadenfreude, to use a good uh, English word, 
of like saying, you see, they are doing even worse than we do. Uh, we notice that there are other great uh, countries, uh, or big countries, like China, which are rising. Uh, we notice that uh, we may not be number one forever, although good political scientists keep assuring us that the United States will remain the only superpower, at least as long as th these people live. Uh, uh, and uh, on the other hand, they clearly are a little bit worried about the situation of the United States, economically, uh, uh, politically, what have you. And this uh, translates into a sort of a derision when it comes to handling uh, the affairs of the EU. Uh, it's, uh, I find it uh, rather depressing, shall we say. Um, it's, um, it's, it's very weird. Of course, uh, Europe still doesn't have as many nuclear weapons as the United States. Uh, but the problem is what the United States is going to do with all those nuclear weapons. Uh, they cost a hell of a lot of money to, to keep up and maintain. And they are basically, uh, let's face it, unusable. And if somebody uses them, it's not going to be a state. It's going to be one of those... Uh, uh, gangs of gangsters uh, which play an increasing role in international affairs and do not fit any of the models for the study of international relations which generations of political scientists uh, have uh, concocted and which essentially look at the world as consistent exclusively of states plus a few rather insignificant international organizations uh, but things like uh, Al-Qaeda or indeed many of the uh, beneficial uh, uh, inter uh, inter uh, one pri private organizations never figure in those kinds of, uh, of designs. So um, there is uh, this uh, um, uh, almost, I would say, uh, willful misunderstanding uh, between uh, Europe and uh, of the United States, and it has, it, it has its dangers. Uh, it is as if uh, the Europeans, uh, having been sometimes grumbling, uh, but rather uh, faithful allies of the United States, even at times in operations in which the United States uh, was acting absurdly, um, I, I'm thinking of the war in Iraq, uh, which isn't so long ago, as if uh, either the, the Europeans had been given the choice either between being faithful satellites, in which case uh, uh, they were taken for granted, or else uh, being denounced as uh, very bad allies, which was the case of the French, uh, and not only of the French, during the, the Iraq war. And I'm afraid that if this sort of attitude which expects the allies of the United States, and particularly uh, Euro the Europeans, uh, to be essentially at the service of American designs, uh, the real it's going to be very bad for both sides. Because gradually, uh, the Europeans, uh, uh, especially since one now uh, uh, treats them with a certain amount of derision uh, or indifference in this country, uh, w will not want to accept being simply battalions in what is basically American operations f forever. So uh, there is a risk there of, uh, of NATO, which hasn't been mentioned yet, uh, losing its, its cohesion. I, I, is if it is given only the choice uh, between following American orders and essentially, uh, perhaps elegantly or uh, uh, on the top of, of their toes, moving out of the American coalition. And if you look at the newspapers, it's clear that many of the countries, which have been until now quite faithful NATO allies, do not see any reason why they should have in the, mid in the Middle East. Um, the position of satellites of the United States, since it's very clear that the United States itself does not qu quite know uh, how to get out of, of that particular mess. So uh, these are the uh, some of the uh, 
uh, reflections that uh, the present situation uh, uh, provokes in me, I would think that if one looks at the future of Europe in, as an actor in the world, uh, the problems will not be uh, the possible collapse of country A or country B, because I'm quite sure that there will be enough solidarity uh, uh, based on mutual interest among the members of, uh, of AU. I think that there's one area in which uh, Europe could have an important role, and this is within the UN. Uh, the UN is in many respects, uh, especially with its uh, <laughs> present uh, uh, top actors, not a terribly exciting organization, but it remains a very important one because many of the tasks uh, which will affect uh, the future of international affairs will not be wars in which indeed the contribution of Europe will be both limited and very unenthusiastic. Uh, it will be uh, what used to be called nation building. It will be uh, civilian uh, operations. Uh, it will be uh, foreign, what used to be called foreign aid. It will be educational. Uh, and there the Europeans have an, an, an experience uh, which is uh, very important, which is d diverse, and uh, which is could be done cooperatively, but not submissively, uh, with the United States. Well, this is about uh, as much as I want to say today, uh, hoping that uh, in the months that come, uh, American newspapers will rediscover Europe and those uh, which, having discovered it, uh, have totally misinterpreted what is actually going on, uh, will have a moment of penance. Thank you. So I think we have uh, time uh, for a few questions. Uh, so I will uh, look for uh, hands and uh, those who would like to participate and then direct these to Professor Hoffman. And if you could again, please just identify yourself and then a question. My name is Leonard Dushenko. I'm from Ukraine. I'm a co-founder of the Harvard Club of Ukraine. And along with some of the colleagues from other clubs, you know, from Italy, uh, Germany, and the US, so we also have a meeting. I have a question to you, you know, about the future of the European currency. Mm -hmm. As you know, there was no uh, single currency, you know, which survived without, monetary union which survived, you know, without a single state in the mm -hmm. history of the world. And that sets up a bad precedence for Euro, you know, and I've been asking this question uh, at meetings with different people, you know, and it seems things are getting worse and worse and Greece might be uh, falling out, you know, of the Eurozone very soon. And then uh, who knows what's going to happen if uh, Spain is going to follow the case. What is your take on this? For once, it's not very pessimistic. <laughs> I have the impression that most of the members of the EU uh, have absolutely no intention of, of letting the thing collapse. Uh, it would look like a disaster. It would look like uh, turning the back to a development which has now been going on for, for quite a while. Uh, there are within the EU rich countries and poor countries as long as the rich countries are willing uh, to contribute to the recovery of those which uh, may have at times mismanaged their own affairs, and when those countries are willing to accept a certain number of not unreasonable limits, uh, it will act as a government, a difficult government, which will spend months and months in negotiations and uh, very savory dinners and so on, but, you know, if one looks at how decisions are made in the United States, I think, go back to the example I gave earlier, about the health care law, it's not going any faster. And there, because of the way the American system is built, everything is at the mercy of judges whose opinions seem to be remarkably parochial. You can predict what a Virginian judge will think. So I'm not very pessimistic. I think there is a sort of bizarre unwritten rule among the members of the EU that they are not going to, they may not work, go forward very fast or very easily. 
but they are not going to go backwards. Now, I've been a student of the EU since, uh, since the beginning, so to speak, uh, and that's what has struck me most. There have been moments of uh, stoppage or, or sort of very, or, or great slowness. It was so in the, uh, in the 70s, except that the bizarre friendship between Helmut Schmidt and his child of a son <laughs> served as a kind of director. But it has never moved backwards. And I think it will continue that. to the financial mm -hmm. crisis because it seems to me that the objections to the uh, entrance of Turkey into the EU uh, existed before the crisis, will exist after the crisis, that many of those objections are, I may say, so perfectly uh, um, full of prejudice. Uh, that, uh, I mean, some of my best French friends, uh, the minute one speaks about letting Turkey in, it's as if uh, they were going to call for a new crusade. But I, I, I think that sooner or later, uh, they will probably realize that it wouldn't be the end of the EU, uh, that it would maybe uh, uh, help in the relations between those Turks who have emigrated uh, throughout Muslim uh, and the EU. So I'm not that pessimistic on that. But I think it will be a, a long time, and that as long as you have a mediocre economic situation, that provides more objections, uh, and there are enough already. So it's not, uh, the French would say, ce n'est pas pour demain. I think that depends very much, a, 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 this is a factor which is increasingly neglected by political scientists. It depends very much on the nature of the leaders. It's quite amazing what different leaders can make, although I had a former student who uh, was an undergraduate uh, uh, who worked <coughs> with me. Uh, he went to MIT uh, to get his PhD. He announced that he wanted to write a PhD thesis about the important role of great men, uh, great American presidents in the making of the United States. And he was told that this is a subject absolutely devoid of importance because people do not matter. <laughs> well, uh, I've lived a long life, too long in some ways, and with one conclusion I have derived from that life is that people do matter. Uh, not only Hitler, who certainly mattered, but also people like Gorbachev. Uh, well, a, a, a good leader matters. And for the time being, uh, the, EU, the EU's top personnel is a bit on the mediocre side. So I think one needs to convince uh, some of the prima donnas in the separate countries, uh, Putin was of two years in particular, uh, that it is important that the EU as such have very strong people. Uh, the moment, which was uh, not so brief, uh, when Delors uh, was uh, the, the head of the uh, Commission, was a very productive moment. Uh, who else would have said to the French, <coughs> you have not only to like the Germans, you have to love the Germans. <coughs> Imagine. Uh, so I think this is an area which depends very much on, on the leadership within. Uh, the, the EU, for instance, and so far it has not been 
in recent years has been uh, not stopped, to put this way. And I can't make predictions. When an individual with individual making predictions is very difficult. Yes, sir. A comment here and then we'll come over here. Yes. that are now um, basically my view would be uniting Eastern mm. and Western Europe in a kind of globalization of fear. Yeah. I work with Roma and I'm particularly mm. concerned mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. not only because of the current deportations but all kinds of historic stereotypes mm. that are being revived right now. Oh yes, and I think that uh, um, a, a period of economic uh, uh, back, um, uh, moving back are a moment of, of very drastic uh, budget cuts, uh, cuts in education, uh, cuts in social security benefits, cuts in jobs, uh, is a very dangerous one. Fortunately, the most of these movements are strictly incapable of joining. <coughs> they are highly nationalistic. They don't know very much what goes on. Uh, um, it's hard to imagine a, uh, a, a Le Pen international. But it is a problem, and I think it will be there for a long time. Um, although, again, if one looks at, at the evolution, it is very par uh, much coordinated with or parallel to the economic situation in the country. But I don't see them taking over, even though from time to time they are very bad surprises, as they have been in Hungary. I can't hear you. Yes. Yeah, Christina Varkis. My name is Yvonne Bolton Griffiths in Berlin. Um, I would like to come back to what you said before when you're saying that the EU is uh, expanding with relative ease and come back to your concept of relativeness. Because if you think back in time, whereas before 1990, when the countries were um, accepting and becoming members of the EU, it was relatively easy to become an EU member. Then in the 90s, with the Copenhagen criteria, it, it became more and more difficult to become a EU member, more and more uh, policies had to be <coughs> implemented. And now if we're talking about Turkey or mm -hmm. uh, Serbia, now like you have the impression that every year, as the year passes, new ideas come up, what kind of conditions have to be fulfilled in order to become mm -hmm. a EU member, such as the treaty of things. Um, I was uh, wondering why we were so optimistic, whether do you think that actually there will be an end in accession or um, will it go on like this that well how many more countries are you thinking about <laughs> <laughs> uh, you tell me I well tell I, me, uh, I, I can start see with six to 27 will it go on for no it's not going to go on forever <laughs> I don't know uh, I, I don't really see at this point at least any significant part of the former Soviet Union that would particularly like to be in, in this. They've probably had enough of being incorporated in another alignment. But I, th I think uh, the one problem which will remain for quite a while is the problem of Turkish. That is certainly true. And there are di enormous prejudices on this front. I have very, very close friends, friends who happen to be, I would say, centrist. They are not on the right but they are intensely Catholic, and for them it would change the nature of, uh, of the EU, which I think is a mistake. Uh, I think the EU would rather benefit from more pluralism in this domain. So there will be obstacles, but I, I don't think that uh, you are ever going to go much beyond 30 or 31 or 32 if some slip, which happens from time to time. Is an, is, is an issue with the economic situation. Uh, it's uh, uh, the, the, nas the leaders have to concentrate much more on the national tasks uh, that are indeed uh, very 
an open layer of unsettling chaotica. But there is, uh, I think it's almost unpredictable. Uh, you can have moments when uh, strong leaders and uh, good leaders appear even in moments of crisis. You have other moments where they don't. I, 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 you know, I have no, no way of, of, of predicting it. But it is not one of the best moments of the usual theory. Uh, for instance, in the case of uh, the top leadership, um, if nobody quotes me, I would have been happier uh, if uh, uh, the former Spanish uh, foreign minister of Europe uh, had stayed on uh, and uh, the present uh, head of the commission, uh, Barroso, had found something else to do. <laughs> uh, I met Mr. Barroso, he's an intelligent man, but he struck me, and uh, don't quote me, I'll be murdered immediately. Uh, it struck me as a man who was thinking primarily about his own career. Uh, it, it, uh, Europe was not preoccupation number one. Uh, this was certainly not the case uh, of, of Delors <coughs> in, uh, in his time. This was not the case uh, of some of the others. So it's very hard to predict the time, how human beings before I get this gentleman, others to uh, speak. Um, I have a question. This is for the year after him, but for the same study. Um, I have a question about the role of um, Europe in the world. Um, I'm an international relations student, and the decline of the transatlantic alliance, mm -hmm. the uh, decline of um, perhaps NATO as the critical security organization, mm -hmm. as well as um, uh, the, the uh, challenges that uh, some of these normative powers in the world, including the United Nations, as well as some of these post-1945 institutions are facing, um, um, make me really question what are going to be those critical mm -hmm. alliances in the world. It seems as if um, um, we should be lead a multipolar world is developing with an urgency <coughs> a world of regions rather than a sole superpower or a bipolar or world. Um, the place for Europe to exert influence at a global level must uh, be in these emerging alliances. So I was wondering, you might be able to um, reflect a little bit on what the future alliances actually might be. Well, it depends on what you mean by alliance. If you mean military alliance, there is a problem. After all, NATO was created as a uh, uh, mode of resistance to, to the Soviet Union. Um, it, as uh, uh, one famous Russian uh, diplomat and uh, researcher said, we are going to do to you, you being the West, the worst thing we can do to you. We are going to prize you of, deprive you of an enemy. And indeed, uh, wh what is NATO's role in this, this case? At this point, um, uh, nobody knows. Which is why uh, alas, one country after the other in the NATO alliance is talking about withdrawing its forces from X, Y, and Z countries in the Middle East um, because they don't see much point in staying. <coughs> so that is a real question. But there are other forms of cooperation, as I was trying to say earlier, than military alliance. Thank goodness. Uh, and uh, a world in which one could reduce uh, military expenditures, uh, which are in some cases quite grotesque, uh, even though they are usually uh, uh, very desirable for um, politicians uh, because it provides jobs in their districts and so on. And if they could cooperate on uh, the task of building an international civil society, I think it would be it much preferable to focusing on NATO, because if you focus on NATO, you have to find yourself a battleground. And personally, I'm tired of battlegrounds. Lauren Beagle from the University of Graz. I'm just curious about um, whether there you see a possibility of convergence of EU and US foreign policy, mm -hmm. because in fact, they've often had similar interests, yet mm -hmm. not much co coordination, yeah. especially in Southeast Europe. 
And in particular, I'm thinking, of course, of the Middle East now, yeah. where both the U.S. and the European Union have been supportive of mm. authoritarian yeah. uh, regimes, yeah. whether or not yeah. this what is happening now, and of course, it's unpredictable how the outcome will be, but whether that will indicate a convergence of some new kind of policy of both the U.S. and the European Union. At this point, it seems to me that the United States has the most difficulty in defining its own policy here. But to ask it to coordinate with uh, other countries, which have sometimes radically different views, is a little premature. It can be done behind, um, behind the scenes, but officially, I don't see it. Um, see now later that we have to see it, seems to me, but there are so many things that should be that have never happened, I don't know. And this is one, of course, of the key weaknesses uh, uh, of the current high command of the EU, which is that uh, uh, the otherwise the, a very nice lady who is in charge of foreign affairs, uh, she reminds me of what was once said of a French foreign minister, who was actually quite a distinguished man when it came to finance and finances. Uh, he was uh, nicknamed Le Ministre des Affaires qui lui sont étrangères. Uh, minister of uh, Affairs, which are foreign to him. <laughs> so that is, that is part of the problem. So uh, they, I'm not very optimistic on this. Well, well I mean, I have to yes. abandon this. Okay, so uh, if uh, all of you would join me in uh, thanking uh, Professor uh, Hoffman. Assumption 